Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our webinar today on higher education in a post-COVID world. My name is Claire Casey. I'm Global Managing Director of the Pol Public Policy Practice of the Economist Intelligence Unit. We are the Research and Analysis Division of the Economist Group. Uh, we organized today's session around the launch of our new study on the shifting landscape for higher education and alternative approaches to ensure its continued sustainability, relevance, and impact. Um, we're going to start today with a brief introductory message from Her Excellency Sheikha Hind, the CEO of the Qatar Foundation, the sponsor of our research. Um, and then we'll turn to a short presentation of the research and then a panel discussion with uh, a group of really esteemed higher education experts. Um, and then we'll turn to audience Q&A and open this up to, to everyone on the, the call today. Um, and you can access that using the Q&A function in, in Zoom, which is at the bottom of the screen. Um, we'll start now with the video. Today I speak to you under surreal circumstances. When this report was written, the world looked very different. We were still going to our offices. Our children were still going to school. University students still went to lectures physically. Our lives were normal. Now, everything's changed. In a matter of weeks, schools and universities have been suspended. 421 million children affected. COVID-19 has done the impossible. It's changed the way we teach and learn almost overnight. It sparked global conversations in education, conversations about future-proofing the way we teach, investing in cloud-based technologies, building resiliency in education systems. But is that really what we should be doing? Should we be future-proofing an education system that doesn't serve our children's futures? Should we be building resilience in an education system that has been so difficult to reform? Instead of fixing, adapting, supporting a narrative of education that puts values in our children that we spend a lifetime to unlearn, how about changing the language altogether? We know that education today, whether it's a freshman in high school or a freshman in university, isn't suited to our needs. We talk about self-motivated learners, but we don't let them choose. We talk about nurturing citizens of the world, but we fail to teach them to love and care for this blue planet. We talk about individuality, but we don't let them choose their own journey in education. We care more about what Netflix has to offer than our schools and universities. Our on-demand culture is even more visible in this time, yet education seems to be the only thing that we have no say over. Why are classrooms still designed for the masses when we know that each student's journey has to be different? Why can my daughter choose what she wants to read, but she can't choose what she wants to learn? Our system fails to nurture its purpose. Our global education system is a well-oiled machine, too well-oiled. We were so used to the way things were that we couldn't imagine it otherwise. Well, the good news is we know what change looks like because we're in the middle of it today. If this pandemic has proven anything, is that we as a society can change. Things that were impossible are suddenly possible. And although it feels like the world is collapsing around us, today we owe it to our children and our grandchildren to change what we know isn't working. As the Arabic saying goes, knowledge is sought. It doesn't come to you, you go to it. Today, the new page is no longer just a dream. Let's have the courage to truly be seekers of knowledge. So as I said, we're gonna to start today with a very brief introduction to the, the report that you will all receive by email and I encourage you to read it in full. I'm just gonna give a very high level overview of the approach we took. Um, if we can go to the first slide. So as Her Excellency Sheikha Hin noted in those introductory remarks, we are at a moment of tremendous disruption. But prior to this, higher education institutions were already facing a shifting, shifting ground underneath them. So what, do we, what are some of those challenges that we looked at? How do 
higher education institutions contribute to an increasingly digital economy and society? How can technology be leveraged to deliver better and more inclusive education? How do they respond to growing demands, which is project projected to skyrocket over the coming decades, but a real shift in the demographics of, the, of that demand, where geographically it is coming from? How do institutions strike the right balance between public and private provision? And that's something I think that we'll, we'll see even, even more um, in, in, in a, as a pressure point in the coming years as, as governments struggle to, to, to fund all the, all the elements of society that they need to. Um, and how do we remain global in an age of what looks to be increasing nationalism? Um, if we go to the next slide. So what we did is evaluate five different mo models that can be considered innovative in their approaches to, to higher education. We looked at the online model, um, offering education to anyone, anywhere, anytime, um, which is flexible, scalable, and considered more cost effective. We looked at the cluster model, where you actually break down some of the traditional silos between institutions. We looked at an experiential model um, where you're actually bringing students out into the world and giving them tangible experiences and the development of transferable skills. We looked at the liberal arts model, which is what produced me and is, is um, historically been very popular in the United States, but isn't around the world um, and is spreading. Um, and the partnership model where organizations are partners, partnering with institutions in their communities, which is considered both an opportunity to get more sustainable funding, but also create a pathway to employment for graduates. Um, none of these models fits every context, and many of them can be combined in, in hybrid approaches, um, but each one offers some interesting opportunities um, to address what the shifting landscape that was already existing and, and now this massive disruption um, in, in the COVID-19 economy. Can we move to the next slide, please? So what has COVID-19 pandemic meant for higher education? We have over 1.5 billion learners around the world who are not able to attend school or university. Um, that's millions of the university students who are pursuing their higher education. Um, and academic institutions are having to acclimate to this new normal. Um, but what does this mean for the future of higher education? That's the question that has brought us here today. Um, I'm really delighted to welcome um, an incredible panel today that brings a tremendous diversity of experience. We have Francisco Manmalejo, who is the education advisor to the Qatar Foundation, um, which he joined after a distinguished career as an education specialist at the World Bank. We have Professor Tim Blackman, who is the vice chancellor of the Open University, which represents the online model that um, we evaluated. Uh, we have Dr. Mary Schmidt Campbell, who is the president of Spelman College and brings to us not only a career of experience with the liberal arts model, but also the cluster model that is um, one of the case studies in our report. Um, and finally, we have Ben Nelson, the chairman, founder, and CEO of Minerva Schools at the Keck Graduate Institute, Institute who can speak to the experiential model case study in the report. Um, I'm going to kick off with some questions for the panelists, and I'll ask the panelists to please turn on your screen and unmute, um, but then we'll open it up for a Q&A, and again, we'll be using the Q&A function at the base of your screen. If you just type a question there, we will get to as many as we can. Um, I'm going to turn to, to you first, Mary, as, as the president of a brick and mortar institution. Um, how has this disruption been felt by Spelman? How have you adapted? Uh, I think like everyone else, this, this, uh, this disruption was particularly jarring for our students. Um, almost out of the blue for them. They were uprooted out of what they call their homes. Uh, so they, within a week, they all had to vacate our, the residence halls. We switched from in-person to online education within a week. So uh, what we learned is that 80% of our students had never taken an online course. We learned that many of our students, not, not many, but a, a significant number of our students uh, didn't have adequate laptops or no laptops at all or did not have access to the internet or adequate internet. So uh, within a very short period of time, we had to really rethink our pedagogy. And our faculty was pretty extraordinary. And this was very instructive to me because it said that when we need to, we really can be innovative. 
we really can move quickly, um, counter to the notion that universities are glacial. And the faculty came together as a learning community and began to talk about what their students needed to be learners and what they needed to be good teachers. So that was very encouraging because we're gonna to need to call on that as we begin to think of the next two or maybe even three years. Thank you. Tim, you were already in the online universe. What do schools like Open University have to offer in terms of lessons and approaches that can be broadly relevant today? Yeah, well, uh, welcome everybody. It's great to, to join you all and, and I hope you're all well and, and keeping safe. Um, yeah, I guess just very briefly a bit of background about the OU so you can understand where we're coming from. We are an entirely, more or less entirely online university, entirely online now, largest university in the UK, received our Royal Charter back in 1969, deliver a range of courses from micro-credentials to PhDs to about 170,000 students. We started off with TV broadcasting. We're now almost entirely working through a virtual learning environment on the internet um, where students can, our students can also work with scientific and engineering equipment and facilities, for example, through the internet. So we were pretty well equipped uh, in terms of the pandemic outbreak. Um, we've been able to keep our services running, um, not facing the extent of challenges that many bricks and mortar universities have had. Um, but we do have a large research and administration campus in, in Milton Keynes near London. Um, we had to get everybody to home working. Three and a half thousand people moved off the campus to home working over two to three weeks. Um, we also, small group tuition is a very important part of our model, even though we are entirely online um, now, but about one in five of our tut tutorials was face-to-face. -face. Um, now all our tutorials are, are run online. And like many universities, we've had to change uh, some of our assessment practices and arrangements, reprioritize some of our research has been disrupted. But overall, our model is robust and we've been able to adapt and adjust to the situation and still serve our students in just about the, the usual way. Um, we also provide a, a lot of courses free on our open learn and future learn platforms. And we've seen huge demand for those courses. And we've been working with governments in the UK and some around the world too, to open up access to free learning so that people particularly challenged economically and in terms of employment worries can access opportunities to reskill and upskill while they're furloughed or, or facing unemployment. So we, we see that as an opportunity to reach out, open up access and really show what higher education can do in a crisis like this. Francisco, you, you take a global view of this. Where are you seeing real variation um, internationally? Sorry, you're on mute. Uh, uh, yes, I'm on mute. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, welcome to everybody. Uh, it's uh, great to participate in this uh, conversation. You know, I think probably it's important to see sort of the global dimension in a way that, uh, uh, first of all, keep in mind that we are talking about more than 200 million students globally, which are not having access at this point to their campus. Um, so, you know, there is a recent report from the World Bank that I recommend everybody to look at, uh, precisely putting in dimension this, uh, the, the whole impact of this. Uh, it's a great recognition, for instance, that uh, only about 60% of students are being able to transfer to the uh, remote teaching. So what that means? Well, great news, 60% of them are able to continue in some way their education. But the bad news is that 40% of them are not. So how uh, the systems are gonna be addressing this? Of course, it is challenging. What, uh, what are the sort of the main factors here? Of course, response has been different uh, uh, considering the uh, uh, contextual differences in each of the countries. For instance, in the case of Qatar, it was interesting to see that in the complex system of uh, the many institutions that are part of the Qatar Foundation, in just two days, the whole system was able to be transferred into the remote teaching. But sadly, that is not the case all over the world. There are many factors involved there. First of all, structural uniqueness. Countries, uh, you know, let me give you an example. In all Latin American countries, uh, in most of the institutions don't offer housing to the students. So at least the problem of 
taking out kids from the school was not an issue for many of those institutions. However, as Mary had indicated before, a number of students don't have access to decent internet. So, uh, so that becomes a significant challenge. The other one has to do, of course, with teachers. For many teachers, transitioning to the online was a matter of, you know, continuing doing things the same way. But for many of them has been, of course, a significantly traumatic event. So the third thing has to do, of course, with the capabilities of the systems and society. The third one has to do with the cultural context, because, of course, it all depends on what is the cultural context in which the educational system is in place. And finally, of course, politics. You know, there are countries in which we have seen that, for instance, teacher unions have been sort of um, blocking the idea of the online teaching, probably because they fear that eventually they might be seen as, uh, you know, the, the ones that can be substituted in the future. So, of course, all of those are the factors that need to be taken in consideration. If I may, Claire, I'd like to talk a little bit about the challenges ahead, because I think that is going to be significantly important in the future for all of us. So, in the very short term, institutions have to, to, to discuss how to minimize the student learning deficit that is happening due to the transition to online. So the short term has been addressed, but in the medium and long term, that is going to be a problem. The second one is how to reduce the inequality due to the technological divide. That is something that, again, it varies country by country. The third one has to do with how to keep students engaged, motivated, and also in a good mental health. You would not believe the case of many students which are experiencing very difficult time just because the lack of socialization that is happening right now. Now, the other one is how to guarantee integrity of the testing and the learning assessment. And the last one, which also is going to be very important in the long term, is how to mitigate the academic impact that is going to happen due to the upcoming financial constraints that we like it or not, all institutions all over the world are going to be facing. So in each of the country context, in each of the institutional context, those are some of the factors that I'm sure that now decision makers are having to face and that the sooner they address, the better they are going to be prepared for a very uncertain future. Thank you, Francisco. Turning to you, Ben, Francisco just laid out a, a tremendously challenging outlook. How are you at Minerva adapting to this? Well, we have, uh, an, in some respects, a very difficult element of adaptation. In other respects, a very easy respect of, uh, perspective on adaptation. And so even though Minerva has our students uh, live in various countries around the world during their four years, students live in seven different countries before they graduate, and the students themselves come from over 60 different countries. And so any, at any given point, more than 90% of our students in location are not from that country. Uh, and so when, when we had to uh, effectively suggest to our students, we couldn't force them because many of our students are not wealthy um, to go home, um, that caused a logistical issue. We also had to extend our residence halls. Many of our students are still in residence even though our academic year is over and will be so for until the end of May at least. Uh, because of difficulties of international transport. And so that has been more of a challenge. But on the other hand, 100% of our education is delivered via seminars using live video online. And so not a single one of our students had to change the format of their education. They didn't have to degrade the quality of their education. Nobody had to move to a pass-fail no one had to actually have any learning outcome impact whatsoever. And, and I think that's actually the most important element of what we're seeing in the COVID-19 world. When we think about what will be happening to institutions after COVID-19, it will largely depend on what they do during COVID-19. And institutions are very much at risk of believing that marketing will get them out of this that where they can say, oh, you know, we've, we've done it. We, you know, we've moved to online, everything is fine. The reality is, is that for almost every institution that is not online, whether they decided to launch Zoom, which is, I think as over a thousand people on this call realize is not particularly difficult, that that's not the hard part. 
The hard part isn't the technology. It's not the online in online teaching. It's the teaching. Most university professors don't know how to engage students in learning environments. They do that, but they've never been trained in it. They've never been assessed in it. And they don't have the incentives to do a good job because their career depends on their research, not their teaching. And so we have to be honest with ourselves that when students and society at large is interfacing with institutions and they're not getting what they're paying for, be it a tuition paying student or a government subsidized student or a philanthropy subsidized student, that there's going to be a, a reckoning. And I think that's really what is crucial in this transition period, but it'll be crucial afterwards as well. Thank you, Ben. Mary, we've heard in everyone's comment references to a range of, of access to, to opportunity um, and income inequality being a, a major factor in how institutions and students are able to adapt to this. How are you thinking about that challenge at Spelman? Yes, I think for, uh, particularly in the United States, uh, this uh, crisis really laid bare uh, all of the inequalities that uh, completely undermine a student's uh, ability to be able to be a, a, a healthy, productive, present and engaged student. Um, at the Atlanta University Center, uh, and Spelman is, is one of four campuses on the Atlanta University campus. There's Spelman, uh, which is a, a school exclusively for black women, Morehouse, a school exclusively for black men, Clark Atlanta University, which is a research university, and Morehouse School of Medicine. Uh, we serve the African-American community. And so we have been especially hit by this because as a health crisis, our population has been more uh, at risk and, be, and been disproportionately impacted by uh, the virus. Uh, we're at risk because financially with all of the um, layoffs and uh, unemployment skyrocketing in the United States, it's our community that's been hardest hit. Uh, and when you add to that the technology divide, then you have a perfect storm of uh, an inequality that is a real challenge to bridge. So when I made the comment earlier that in fact, as we are rethinking what our priorities are as, as educational institutions. For those of us who are in urban areas and are much more locally based as opposed to globally based, uh, we have a real responsibility to become part of the solution that corrects an inequity that begins in uh, early childhood education and through K through 12. And I'll give you one example of what I mean. A few years ago, Spelman College gathered all the principals in our neighborhood and we said, what do you need from us? We're educational institutions. How can we become involved? And they said, teach our students to read. We took our education department. We, we, we trained about 100 students to go out into that community. They worked for two years with 150 students. And in two years, they materially changed the reading skills in this community. So in point of fact, our colleges and universities have the capacity to be agents of that change themselves. You can do that for reading, you can do that for math, you can do that by bringing students onto campus early and beginning the college preparation. We can change some of the focus that we have, but we have to do that if we're going to get to the foundation of writing these economic inequalities. Thank you so much, Mary. I'm going to begin to weave in some of the questions from the audience because they are so relevant to where we are in this conversation already. Francisco, Mary just spoke to how she's thinking about economic inequality and addressing it in, in a national context in the United States. But there, you know, 50% of the world doesn't have access to the internet. People are trying to adapt to this in, in very low tech environments um, and very fragile contexts. How what are the models? Are there, are there approaches that can be deployed? How are you thinking about this at the Qatar Foundation? Well, you know, I, I think, uh, and that's why I find this uh, report that, uh, that uh, you know, the Economist Intelligence Unit has produced, I find it extremely timely, uh, you know, timely and extremely relevant. Because basically what the report is, uh, you know, helping us to think collectively is 
why not we take this significant, grave, and complicated time as an opportunity to challenge our assumptions, as a catalyst for change, I might say, and to be very serious about uh, recognizing if what we are doing as of today is really up to the standards of the future. Uh, you know, you, you, uh, all of us heard the, the message from, uh, you know, Her Excellency uh, when, when she was making the point about the fact that probably from now, up to now, we have not been able to fulfill that particular uh, predicament, I might say. You know, let me, let me tell you about some of the assumptions that we are trying to challenge here at the Qatar Foundation, but also I'm sure it is applicable to many cases. Uh, do students learn due to, despite of, or independently of what we teach them in the classroom? Honestly, many times we don't know. Our rankings are as important as we think they are. What is education about? Is about only preparing for the jobs or is preparing personas? For, is preparing integral citizens for the needs of the future? How outdated are uh, the academic workloads in our academic programs in our institutions? Do we still believe that the way to measure learning is by counting seat hours and having a simple grade? You know, all of those are assumptions that we honestly, seriously have to challenge today because I truly believe that unless we do that, unless we disrupt, unless we are willing to take risks, probably very soon, as soon as conditions become some kind of normal, the behavior of all of us in higher education will try to become the same as it was before. And I think what this crisis is telling us is that we no longer can have the luxury of assuming that things will be like they used to be and that business will be as normal as it used to be. It is time for all of us, and this is what we are trying to do in our work here in the foundation, it is time to, for us to challenge those assumptions and to try to think about creatively a redesigned higher education that is more responsive to the needs of future society. Thank you. Tim, I saw you nodding along as Francisco was speaking. I, I, what do you have to add to this? How, how is the Open University and you, how are you thinking about this disruption and adapting, adapting models going forward? Yeah, well, use of the internet and digital media is, a, is an incredibly powerful way to open up access to higher education. And, and you know, the use of these technologies has been growing right across the sector worldwide. It's a, it's a particularly good way for students to learn who need flexibility, who are combining work with study or have got childcare responsibilities or a disability. So um, although there are um, digital divides in, across the world, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that using digital media and online is an incredibly good way to reach many people who wouldn't otherwise be able to benefit from higher education. Um, but a couple of other brief points. Um, ben made this point that, that really good online education takes a lot of investment. It takes expert mm -hmm. faculty, uh, expert designers, developers, uh, really good course design and pedagogy. And it's taken us many years to get to the standards we have at the Open University now. So it's, it's not just a, a simple sort of transition over a few weeks to online delivery. It takes a lot of investment. But um, it's also important, I think, to appreciate that, that how you do online education needs to take into account the fact that many people don't have great bandwidth. Many people only have mobile devices. So certainly at the OU, we design our online provision to be accessible, but to be, um, a, it can be used on a mobile device. It, it doesn't require lots of bandwidth. So there are ways to take these um, inbuilt inequalities into account. Um, and that's something that's very important to our mission at the OU. Our, our mission is a social mission. And we're really much more about getting higher education out there at, at a mass scale so that more and more people can benefit from what higher education provides than the technology. The technology is a means to an end. The end is that higher education 
that the, the more highly educated a society is, the better that society is to live in, to grow up in. So th that that's the really important aspect, I think, is finding a way for higher education to be as universal as possible. Thank you. Ben, can, can you weigh in on that? Sure. I, you know, I think that oftentimes you look at the economic divides in, in the world and um, we, we say as institutions that in, in some ways it's done to us, right? Um, that, well, you know, there are these economic problems and, you know, oh, well, what can, what can we do about it? Or even worse, we talk about, and especially this is the case in the United States where, you know, very selective institutions will say, oh, look at all the wonderful work we do uh, to bring in uh, poor students. Yet at the same time, more than half of the students in the Ivy League come from the 1% wealthiest households in the world. Um, and so, you know, if those are need blind admissions processes, then clearly you've not uh, either you've not taken or have taken and never learned your college statistics. And the, the issue is that these are choices. Every university makes a choice, right? And so if you have a beautiful campus, yet some of your students don't have the appropriate technology to benefit from that, then you've made the choice to invest in something that is fundamentally exclusive as opposed to inclusive, right? And you can go all the way down to the open university Well, you'll make other choices, right? Of saying, you know what? We've got to be able to do mobile delivery and make it uh, ultimately accessible, but maybe there is some sacrifice about the screen real estate. That's just the, the, the trade-off. So every institution has to make a choice as to how inclusive they want to be. When we started Minerva, we wanted to be fully need blind, meaning that we didn't advantage wealthy applicants in the, in the admissions process. So as an example, we charge less than half of what a private American university typically charges, yet 80% of our students cannot afford it. And we don't advantage poor applicants, much like we don't advantage rich applicants. It just evens the playing field. But our trade-off, and we had to make trade-offs, is that we kept our institution small. Because when you have so many students coming in that cannot afford it, you have to find scholarship money. And so that is a constraint, that's a limiter as to the size of what we provide. And that is primarily because we made another choice to ensure that all of our classes are small. We don't have any classes that are above 20 students per class. Now, if we made a different choice and said, you know what, this education is crucial and we have the capacity and want to educate thousands as opposed to hundreds of students, right, then the constraint would be, well, let's offer it in large classes, which we can do, right? And so every institution has to make that set of choices. And we all have a responsibility, frankly, that society should hold us to, especially those of us who receive government largesse, whether it is directly, or in our case, simply because we're a nonprofit, even though we don't take money directly from the government, every time that somebody makes a donation to support a scholarship, the government gets less taxes, right? Less, less tax revenue in the American model. And so we have a responsibility to be stewards for society in the right way. And I think that government funding should be tied in one way or another to the makeup of the student body, not necessarily for a prescribed makeup, but just to verify that indeed a university is serving a public mission if it's supposed to be publicly supported. And if it chooses not to, that's fine. It just doesn't need to have public support. Thank you. You referenced scale. We have a lot of, we have, you know, we have over a hundred questions now. Um, and several of them get to this question of how do you have, how do you create some scalable solutions and whether this disruption could actually produce more scalable educational solutions. I'm curious, Mary, could you weigh in here on what about our, how we think about education, how we think about the classroom model, what about that changes or does it? Do, do, do the old principles hold in a new environment? So uh, let, let, me, let me speak first to, uh, in response to uh, something that Ben said, because I think it's really important and really needs to be underscored. This, this notion about we make choices. At Spelman College, 48% of our students are eligible for Pell. And, and, and like you, Ben, 
about 80 to 90 percent in any given year require financial aid, even though our tuition is half as much as the tuition of other uh, elite liberal arts colleges. So you definitely make uh, choices. And, and so you have, a, you know, colleges which have spare, lean physical plants, but they have an incredible faculty who are absolutely energized about teaching and learning about teaching. Um, but, but the other aspect uh, that was, you pointed out, Claire, early in your introduction is this notion that we do have different models. And so the consortium model, the partnership model becomes extremely important in days like this. So in fact, um, we at the Atlanta University Center all got together and decided that it is absolutely imperative that our students be in the forefront of technology. And so we formed a data science initiative together with our medical school, our research university, and our two liberal arts colleges. And even though we're going through this, uh, this transition, we were able to set up 40 internships virtually to begin to in, uh, get our students to understand the power of mastering uh, the digital world and, and the world of, of, da of data science. So, so being able to understand who your natural partners are uh, among other academic institutions is critical, as well as your partners um, outside. But in terms of scale, this is where colleges and universities have to stop being so precious and siloed and sequestered. Um, because as we begin to develop these kinds of networks, we understand, oh, I'm very good at this. I will let you do that because that's where you excel. And so we don't have to have these redundancies. Um, and in a city like Atlanta, uh, we, can, we can partner not only within a consortium, but we can partner between our consortium and a big a private university like Emory or a big public like Georgia Tech and, and everybody benefits from that kind of collaboration. But that takes a very different mindset from the one that we have now. Because if we're still back into the sort of old marketing and competition model, uh, we're, we're not gonna get anywhere. And so we have to create a new way of thinking about seeing our university networks as being available to get the most people in them at, at having the highest quality education. Uh, Claire, that's why I, uh, and also connecting to that, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, there are, again, as part of this challenging of our assumptions and our institutions and connecting to what Mary and Ben had indicated, this requires at the same time to think about, for instance, the whole accreditation model, because many of the reasons why we accumulate all that kind of stuff in each of the institutions is related to the way that the accreditation model is pushing us to do it. Um, so the whole, uh, you know, the, the identification of what it is a good quality of education many times is associated to many of those inputs that each of the institutions are tend to, to, to keep just for their own. And then uh, the need <clears throat> to outreach, the need to collaborate, they need to, uh, you know, as in fact, the word collaboration means it's very different to cooperation because cooperation is to continue doing the things you do with others, while collaboration is for both of you to do something new, something innovative. And again, we don't have time now. We need to act upon those things. Francisco, thank you. I, I was struck by both what you said around collaboration and the creative nature of that and Mary's uh, mention of virtual internships and that, that innovation that has come out of this moment. Tim, a lot of folks on the questions are asking about how the online model might apply to STEM courses and things that are traditionally done in a lab-based environment. Are there innovations there? Are there partnerships there that you can capture to, to, to make that kind of learning still possible? Yeah, um, STEM is certainly one of the big frontiers, engineering, science, technology. We've addressed that a number of, of ways at the OU, and, and we do share this with other institutions as well. So we provide what we call an open STEM lab to underpin many of our science and technology courses, where we have an array of equipment on our campus in Milton Keynes that students can then use at a distance from their kitchen table with their laptop 
operating a piece of engineering equipment, running a scientific experiment, carrying out an astronomical uh, observation. So, uh, and, and although we use lots of simulation in many of our courses, like a simulated field trip, for example, we also provide access to that real equipment that, that can then be operated at a distance. And we find that's even better in terms of particularly developing the skills and confidence that students need when they go into the workplace to operate that kind of kit uh, with an employer. Um, and we're able to scale it by basically just having lots of devices that students can all use at the same, at the same time. Um, certainly one of the big benefits of online is, is scalability. We produce a course that can be taken by hundreds, thousands or tens of thousands of students but, but we also put the students into a, into a tutorial group of at the most 20. Uh, and that's based on often uh, very collaborative, collaborative learning models. So they're, they're learning the soft skills alongside the hard skills that um, is a mix of, if you like, liberal education and, and training for the workplace. And we find that works very well to work with a collaborative pedagogy to be able to develop that mix of competencies that a, a student needs these days. And, and we find that we can scale that as well. So certainly STEM and access to uh, engineering and scientific facilities and collaborative learning, giving that learning that social dimension are real frontiers and pr probably the area that we're investing most in and researching most at the Open University, but it is possible to do it. Thank you. Ben, I wanted to turn to you. Um, a lot of our questions are about the future of international education. Um, I know I studied abroad. There are international students around the world. It's one of the things that knits us together as a global community, and it's part of the basis of your model. How are you thinking about the future of international education and travel and international students? Well, we think a lot of it, it can be a, a part of the scaling solution. Right, and so if you, if you really think about what the core value of education is in today's world, I would argue in a world after the printing press, but certainly in a world after the invention of the internet, the dissemination of knowledge is no longer paramount. There, there are far better ways to disseminate knowledge than to pay thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars. And when I'm saying pay, not just the, the, the student, but government or somebody who's paying for this to merely disseminate knowledge. The key is to understand how to apply particular cognitive tools to new instances, to scenarios that you've never encountered before. That's colloquially known as wisdom. Right? And to teach wisdom, you actually don't have to focus on tests and memorization, you have to focus on applications. And so part of what we do uh, at Minerva is focus on teaching transferable tools and applying them in various contexts academically. So that means that when you are taking a science class or taking a history class or taking a business class, you're deploying the same cognitive tools to, a, to solve problems in those different contexts, because that actually allows you to figure out how do I get to a root cause of a problem first before trying to solve it. And developing that habit is really important. At the same time, contexts are also true culturally. And so when you apply those same exact tools in your lived experience, both in a massively diverse student body, but also among from, uh, among different cultures as you travel the world, right? And that, re that transference of uh, applications is another important aspect. Now, to deliver the kind of education that we deliver, it turns out that offline instruction simply doesn't work because you need to actually have a set of data that goes with the student from course to course and collecting and utilizing that data in offline environments is incredibly difficult, especially when it's first introduced. So you can imagine what would happen if universities, for example, adopted their first year of education delivered online, even if their students happen to be living on campus, as we do with a number of our partner institutions, 
And then the university would say, you know what? And every single student will have to spend their third year outside of campus in different countries applying that education, even though, again, that education can be delivered by those professors on campus. Now, what, what that means is that a, a university with the same physical plant can accommodate twice as many students. And that's where you start getting some real efficiencies, right, as far as lowering the cost of instruction and making it accessible to more people. Fantastic. Thank you. Francisco, you wanted to follow up there. Yeah, I, I'd like to, uh, you know, it's uh, on the topic of international education, because I see that there are many questions from the audience uh, on that as well. Uh, and connecting to what Ben is making the reference to. Uh, you know, if, if we see one area where there is a significant disruption right now happening in the entire sector of higher education is precisely on international education in terms of the number of students which are not going abroad anymore. At this point, it is estimated that around 70% of the students who were abroad now went back home. And many of them are not planning to return. So you might say, well, you know, if we have an institution in which we have 10 students, uh, which are international students, that's not a big deal. But let's go to a country, let's say Australia, where 40% of the national enrollment in higher education are students from abroad. So what are going to be the implications of losing that 40% of enrollment and also the financial considerations associated with that? So this is one of the times, again, in which we should challenge our assumptions. Our traditional assumption has been that the only way you can gain international experience is by going abroad. Ben already have indicated a way to do that, but not having to go abroad. But in the scenario in which students will not go out, which is very clear at least for the next semester, so the question is, what do we do? And, uh, you know, this is when we have to challenge our assumptions. Internationalization is not about going abroad. It is a, a very elitist approach. Only 1% of the national, of the global enrollment in higher education goes out. So what that means, that 99% of the students cannot have the luxury of an international education, they should, and they, sh they need it for the future. So what do we do at the local level in order to embed the international dimension in the preparation of all students? Ideas like the one Ben is suggesting is one of those, Ideas such as the whole concept of comprehensive internationalization or internationalization at home or virtual mobility or zero semester abroad or micro campus at home. There are many ways in which you really can embed the international dimension into the preparation of all the students. Thank you. If we think about just not skills for jobs, but skills for the future society, people where increased tolerance, understanding, awareness of global issues are going to be very, very important for higher education. And uh, we need to work on that. Thank you, Francisco. So this is a challenging moment and it's going to drag on longer than any of us would like, but we do expect life to return to something resembling normal in the future once there is a vaccine. Mary, can you speak a bit about what we do want to return to, what we don't want to lose in, in, in this time? Uh, absolutely. I, 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 I could not agree more with, with uh, Ben's assessment that you don't need colleges to acquire knowledge. You know, not, knowledge, is at our, knowledge is at our fingertips. Um, but there is one aspect of college, and, and particularly the residential um, college, that I think is extremely difficult to recreate online. And that's the fact that at the age uh, when most um, students are coming to college, which is between 17 and 24, right? This is a, a, a time when they're coming of age. It's an incredibly critical um, moment developmentally. And so the nature of these relationships um, and uh, the, the uh, quality of collaboration, and collaboration is important not only because it's a learning experience, but it's also uh, an experience in how to develop relationships, how to uh, cope with clashes and disruptions and differences in, in worldviews. Um, all of these have been an incredibly uh, a fundamental part of what these college years have meant. It's why when, when uh, students leave college, we can look and see uh, strong alumni networks 
because these are relationships that endure for a lifetime. These are the relationships, the networks that people call on during their lifetime. And one of the reasons, for example, that a place like Spelman has a, a very high social mobility rating is that our students come in, they forge these relationships, forge these contacts, and then they are able to go out and they are able to literally change their lives, the lives of their families and the lives of their communities. And we have to figure out how to retain that aspect of higher education. Fantastic. You, you talked about uh, the university or the college as an engine of social mobility. They're also engines of knowledge and research. And I'm curious if anyone in the group would like to weigh in on, on how to adapt the, the research um, and knowledge drivers that are, that, are, that are so important in our higher education institutions um, through how to navigate through this, through this period and where we, where we might see those, those programs on the other side. Does anyone want to weigh in there? I think, Cla Claire, the, the, the point has already been made that we're in a very different type of knowledge world where the shelf life of knowledge is getting shorter and shorter all the time. Um, and while discovering new knowledge and innovating remains incredibly important, um, the fundamental issue for me in terms of the future is that uh, everybody has to be a lifelong learner. Learnability, the ability to just keep on learning um, and not necessarily to discover and create new content, but to actually be able to apply it, put it to use. So I think the, the really big message for me at the moment is the shelf life of knowledge is becoming so short that both our approach to research and to teaching and learning has to adapt to that world now. And, and I would say that, you know, there's, there's a, um, a certain uh, a trope that is perpetrated by a number of universities that um, the research mission of the institution is critical to the educational mission, mission of the university. Um, and that's nonsense. Um, research is incredibly important in and of itself. The, the goal of acquiring knowledge is crucial. But the reality is, is that the vast majority of undergraduate students, different, of course, for PhD students where education and research are tied at the hip, but in undergraduate and professional master's programs, the vast majority of those students either will never go into research as a career, or if they do, will not be because a professor happens to be doing the kind of research that that student is going to be focused on for the rest of their life. Because at the world's greatest research universities, the amount of fields, micro fields that are covered are a minuscule fraction, less than 1% of the various fields that are, that are actually being researched. And so there is no scenario where going to a research university enables you to actually be exposed to all of the research that's available. Reality is, is that if you have professors that understand research, right, and can then teach students how to take research methodologies and approaches, enable them to pursue what they're interested in using techniques that broadly work, that's actually what matters. And the connection to the actual research that's done at the institution is, uh, is tenuous. And therefore, the, the, in my opinion, the key is for universities, again, to be honest with funders, primarily with governments, and not conflate the two. Don't take money that governments allocate to educate students and steal that to do research. Instead, go to governments and make the argument that research is critical for the country, for society, for the world at large, and get it funded separately, right? And don't have this cross-pollination because it creates all sorts of moral hazard problems. So we have yeah. four minutes left, and I'm going to ask that everyone on the panel respond to one of the best questions I've seen come through. We have 185 questions, six, they're pi piling up, but this one I thought was a good challenge and one that we could deal with in a sort of quick fire round which is what is the role of the student as a partner in this transformation? We've talked a lot about collaboration. We've talked a lot about partnership. Where's the student in this? Mary, can you kick us off? Sure, we, we, we just put together our team for the future. We're calling it the, the future of Spelman 2021. And it was, we were absolutely clear with ourselves that we had to have student voice on there. 
And the student, I, I, we had our first meeting and what she brought to the conversation, what she brought to the table was invaluable. Our students, one of the things that uh, makes for a good uh, teaching is to create a student who takes agency over her own education. Um, uh, one of the things about a good teacher is that she gives that student that agency and allows them to make choices about their education. And so the same is true institutionally. If we're going to forge ahead and be successful, we have to have the student voice uh, in this conversation and listen to it along with every, giving it the same weight as every other voice. Great, thank you. And the only way to do that is by changing our systems in such a way that they become more flexible. Because up to now, still we have the assumption that the only ones who can define what the students should learn are us, the teachers. And they are the ones who should define what they want to learn and we should enable that. I think that's a big transformation that we should, we should, uh, we should uh, sort of uh, change our mindset in order to make possible for that to happen. Tim? Yeah, well, students are co-creators. Um, we work, we co-design, co-create our courses with our students. And the point's been made already, but I think an incredibly powerful thing our students can bring is their diversity. Their diversity is a resource we can use in great teaching and learning and I think we're only often at the beginning of understanding how to use our students div diversity of backgrounds experience and knowledge as a learning resource in our pedagogy. Wonderful and Ben I'm going to give you the final word. So I think students have uh, actually an extraordinary responsibility this year because students really for the first time uh, at least in my living memory have the ability to bring institutions down to bankruptcy this year. Um, they can just vote with their feet in ways that they've never been able to before. And so on the one hand, students have a responsibility to understand that just opting to skip out on college for a year, as many can afford to do, can literally shut down the institution. Whereas on the other hand, if institutions don't realize that they need to communicate what it is that is happening next year for students, students should exactly do that. And so the role of, of the student, I think for the first time in, at least in living memory, is that of determinant partners at what universities should be doing and which ones will have the right to serve them moving forward. Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists for what was a really tremendous conversation. It is, it is a distressing moment we are all living through, but it's exciting to see so much innovation and so much fresh thinking about how we can remain effective and relevant in this, in this environment. Um, so thank you to all the panelists, to all of our participants. I'm sorry we didn't get to even a, a, a tiny share of the questions that you shared with us, um, but it's been, it's been a pleasure to engage in this conversation. Thank you so much. We will be circulating the report and I hope everyone downloads it and gives it a read because there are some great ideas drawing from all the models that we saw represented here today. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Yeah.